Hi, welcome to Worship at Incarnation. We're so glad that you're able to join us online. Uh, today is Father's Day, and so we want to say Happy Father's Day to all of our fathers out there. Uh, we thank you for all the love and care you have shown us and for ways in which you help us and teach us new things about who God is and what God is doing in this world. Today, the focus of our sermon is going to be on paradox as we continue in our sermon series of Renew Your Life, uh, the paradox of of the reality that we live in right now, that while there is great anxiety, we also have great hope, and that hope belongs in Jesus Christ. And so for worship today, we invite you to enter in however you feel fit. Uh, we will be serving communion, as you can see later on in the service, and so you, if you haven't already, I encourage you to uh, grab a piece of bread, maybe a cracker, and some grape juice or some wine so you can participate later on in the service. To begin our worship today, I invite you uh, to pray this prayer of confession with me as it appears on your screen. Let's pray together. You asked for my hands, that you might use them for your purpose. I gave them for a moment, then withdrew them, for the work was hard. You asked for my mouth to speak out against injustice. I gave you a whisper that I might not be accused. You asked for my eyes to see the pain. I closed them, for I did not want to see. You asked for my life, that you might work through me. I gave a small part that I might not get too involved. Together we pray, Lord, forgive my calculated efforts to serve you only when it is convenient for me to do so, only in those places where it is safe to do so, and only with those who make it easy to do so. Amen. Friends in Christ, we have the forgiveness of sins and the riches of God's grace. This grace has been given to you. Thanks be to God. Amen. Somebody keep on 
Good morning. Good to have all of you here. Uh, we're continuing our sermon series, Renew Your Life, and today we're focusing on the chapter uh, on paradox. And paradox are just uh, uh, two statements that on one level seem to be contradictory, or two images that seem to be contradictory, that in a sense both are true. And so it's living with kind of the messiness, some of the ambiguity, and some of the uncertainty of life that we're going to be focusing on today. But I want to begin just with a couple of words from Mark 8, because it gives you a sense that at the heart of the following of Jesus' faith, there is paradox. So Jesus has uh, asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? And then who do people say that I am? And Peter had come back and he'd kind of gotten the right answer. You are the Messiah. And then Jesus had to instruct him a little bit about what that Messiah was actually going to mean. And then he invited them to imagine this as far as a way to follow this Messiah. He said that. He called the crowd with his disciples and he said to them, If any of you want to become my followers... Let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Think about that paradox. Um, to, be, to claim yourself as a follower of Jesus, you have to deny yourself. So you deny yourself to claim yourself as a follower of Jesus. It's a paradox. For those of you who want to save your life, will lose it. Think about that. We save our lives by losing our lives. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give us in return for their life? Here ends the reading of the Gospel. And one more uh, greeting to all of you. A uh, greeting to fathers and grandfathers on this Father's Day. It's good to have all of you here listening in. I was thinking about my own dad as I was contemplating this sermon for today. And one of the things I remember asking him was, as a pastor, Dad, when were the pivotal parts in your own ministry where an event happened or you learned something new or you had an experience of God's presence that just changed the way you thought about things? And he listed a number of pivot points for him throughout his whole ministry. But one of the ones that he mentioned was a, an experience he had in Oxford, England at a uh, continuing ed event. And he was just with people who were just kind of world-renowned thinkers and leaders. And 
he was there and they kind of got a sense of the expansiveness of the world that they've been a part of, the, the thinking that's been part of the whole tradition of the church, and it just began to blow his mind. And one of the things he said was simply this. He said, um, I got to the point where I began to think that there's a lot more questions in life than answers. A lot more questions in life than there are answers. Well, as a kid who was young in the ministry at the time who wanted answers, that's not the quite, quite the, the response that I wanted from my dad. But I've thought about that a lot since. There are a lot more questions in life than answers at times, aren't there? And this life is way messier than we'd like it to be. Candidly, there are times when I just I wish life was far more tidy than it actually is. Uh, for instance, I wish that uh, we knew very clearly what was good and what was evil in this world, and that there was no ambiguity between them. And yet that's not always the case, is it? I, I wish that there was uh, a way for us to be able to acknowledge and to, to affirm those who do good in the world, and for those who are perpetuating evil in whatever way, for them to have consequences that they'll have to live with. But that doesn't always happen either, does it? I wish even thinking about my own life of faith and following Jesus that I could say very clearly to you who are listening today that, that each step along the way and each moment of my life I am living fully as an integrated person of Jesus in the way I act and the way I think and the way I respond to this world. But it's just not the case, is it? I wish I could tell you that my motivations for what I was doing every day were pure. But if I scratch very superficially below the surface. I'll know that sometimes I act in a way to avoid confrontation, and sometimes I speak in a way to elicit affirmation. And my motivations aren't always that pure. It's a messy world, isn't it? I grew up in a family that struggled with chemical dependency, so my brother went to treatment when he was 17, and. Uh, our family went through family treatment, and one of the things I remember from that uh, training time and also from the just living into it for the rest of my life is that uh, systems that are addicted, one of the ways that they respond because they get stuck in particular ways of acting with one another, uh, and especially when they become very anxious about things, revert to either or thinking. They revert to either or thinking. And you can think about that not only as individuals, you can also think about it as communities. Candidly, you can think about it as where we are as a society right now. I mean, think about all of the different paradoxes, all of the ways that people are just parsing out an either-or way of thinking in this world. And it's not advancing the cause, is it? I think there's something about a maturing faith that has to allow for more questions than answers. I think there's something about a maturing faith that has to simply acknowledge that though we'd love the world to be boxed in and far tidier and neater than it actually is, the world is messy. My life is messy. Your life is messy. Our communities are messy. And so who are we going to be with one another as we make this journey together? Parker Palmer uh, wrote this marvelous book called The Promise of Paradox. And in it, he has this phrase. He said, Perhaps contradictions are not impediments to the spiritual life, but actually an integral part of it. Through them, we learn that the power for life comes from God and not from us. We don't have all the answers. We can't think sometimes our way out of situations. We can't just purely act out of situations. We need some kind of encouragement, some source of power, some source of wisdom and insight that will allow us to imagine something beyond the current situation we find ourselves in. Through them, we learn that the power for life comes from God and not just from us. I tell you, if you go back to the, the biblical witness, as we did with Mark's gospel today, uh, it's just full of paradox. Think about the paradoxes in those few verses that we read today. Uh, if you want to follow Jesus, you need to deny yourself to be able to claim yourself fully as a follower of Jesus. If you want to save your life, you need to lose it. 
And if you want to find your life, you have to release it. All of these ways that Jesus talks about the kind of paradoxical nature of this life of faith. It's, it's bigger than just clean, neat answers along the way. Think about even the way that Jesus did his ministry. Um, the people who were in for Jesus were often the people who were out for the culture that he lived in. Uh, the poor that were he often addresses. The poor he would consider to be uh, rich in mercy and grace. And the wealthy were impoverished by their greed and their money. That's the kind of imagery that Jesus used. And at the end, think about the core image of our Christian faith. It's what? Death and resurrection. For new life to emerge, something has to die. We began this sermon series wanting to focus on uh, our reactions to COVID and what that means for us. And of course, we also have the imagery of all the strife and the racial uh, injustice and striving that we're also trying to, to work with and impact in our world today. But I started thinking about the whole imagery of COVID and how things have to die in order for something new to emerge. And I'm just thinking about myself personally. Um, I don't know if there are uh, any extroverts out there, uh, but as an extrovert, this has been a rough period. It's just been a rough period. It's funny, I've talked to people who would describe themselves as far more introverted than I am, and every once in a while I'll get the response, well, this is totally heaven for me. This is fantastic. There, I've been told not to engage with other people in the world. Or this is how I run my life anyway. Uh, it's not how I've run my life. And I'll tell you, this uh, sense of uh, isolation and loneliness that it's brought has been very deep and very palpable at times. But what I'm discovering in the process of it is that the paradox is that isolation and loneliness creates a pathway of greater desire for community. And community that means something. So the superficiality of relationships, I, I, it just, I'm finding myself having less and less time for because I just want to engage people and I want to engage this world on stuff that means something. The isolation, the, the loneliness of this time, paradoxically, has been a pathway for me to have an even a deeper sense of my longing for community. And something had to be released in me to understand that. Something had to die in me for that new life to begin to emerge. Let me take you to one more image. So we talk about the struggle with COVID and the isolation. And now we're also dealing with uh, the issue that began in our community with the killing of George Floyd. And what do we do and how are we going to see ourselves as uh, people of God, specifically, who we're addressing today, uh, in this world? So last weekend I went down to the George Floyd Memorial and I just needed to, to be in that space on 38th in Chicago. And I was walking around that space and I just sensed all of the deep paradoxes. Uh, there was great lament and grief. And there were also great signs of hopefulness. There was a sense of, of togetherness because you could see just lots of people who were gathered around the different parts of the memorial. But everybody felt like they were doing it in their own way. And so in the, even in the togetherness, there was a, a separateness of the experience. There's great paradox just living in that space with one another. One of the beautiful things that I noticed was that uh, there were a lot of parents who were there with their kids and they were walking them from spot to spot in that two or three block area and they're just using the flowers and the ashes and the graffiti and the, the images that have been created, the, the paintings on the wall, to just tell the story to the next generation. That allowed me to become intensely hopeful that that work is being done. I was thinking about um, that as I was making my way and what were the primary images that I was left with. And there were so many that were there, but one of them was a quote from uh, 
James Baldwin, and James Baldwin is a, uh, an author and an activist in the 20th century. And uh, it was just a poster that was just affixed to one of the light poles in that area. And he said this, Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Not everything that is faced can be changed, and doesn't that bring us a great pain? Like, think of how, how much courage it takes to stand up and say, we've got to face some things in our world, and to know how many times over the last decades and hundreds of years that, especially for the black community in our United States, it has not changed. Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed ultimately until it is faced. So we're going to end this sermon with just a couple of reflection questions. And I want you to think through in your own life. Uh, it may be a little bit unsettling, but I think part of the paradox of living in this time is there's just going to be an unsettled piece of being with one another. Uh, it can't be. It's not all clear. Uh, we can't neat and tidy and pretty this thing up. We just have to live into the messiness of it. And sometimes there are way more questions than we have answers. But I want you to think through these three questions. Um, what do you need to face in your own life these days? What are the impressions or the ways that you view others or um, the ways that you grew up maybe or how you see the things that are happening in the world today? Uh, what do you need to face personally? If we're going to be people who lend ourselves and offer ourselves to the cause of Jesus in creating this world that imagines people gathered with one another around a common table. What do you need to face individually? Second question is this. Uh, what do you need to face interpersonally? So think about the relationships that you have. Uh, have there been times when you have intentionally or unintentionally offended another person just because of who they were. Just because of who they were. Maybe you've been on the receiving end of that. What do you have to face as far as your willingness to, to maybe release that or maybe to go back and confront it if possible? Maybe it's not possible. But to be able to re release it so you can be free of that, so you can consider yourself and imagine yourself living more freely with one another? What do you need to face interpersonally these days? And the third thing is, um, what do you think we need to face corporately? What do we need to face corporately? As people of God, certainly. As neighbors who are part of a community. I want you to just spend a little time, sometime today, and just go through those three questions. What do we need to face individually? What do we need to face interpersonally? What do we need to face corporately? Because candidly, I think what's going to happen is when we face things, we learn that there are some things about us, about the way we think and the way we act and the way we imagine this world, that candidly need to die off. They need to be released. They need to be let go. But let me remind you of the beauty of this paradoxical faith of Jesus. Ultimately, it is through what? Death, letting go, releasing, that a pathway for new life will emerge. Amen. May your struggle keep you near the cross. May your troubles show that you need God. May your battles end the way they should. And may your bad days prove.
Friends, let us pray together. Gracious God, we give you thanks today for our fathers. We celebrate the love and care they show us. Thank you for how they reflect your love to us through their words and actions. Yet, God, today we also lift up to you those for whom it is a difficult day, as they mourn the death of, of a father, for those who are estranged from their father, for those who long to be called dad, and for those who gave up that hope long ago. Comfort them and bring them peace. Lord Jesus, you invite us in the midst of our struggles to keep near to your cross, that in our troubles we recognize how much we are in need of you each and every day, that even on our bad days you prove how good you are to us. You call us to lose our life for your sake in order to find new life in you. Each day as we carry the cross, grant us the courage to deny more and more of ourselves for the sake of the other. Renew our nation, Lord God, in the ways of justice and peace. Guide those who make and administer our laws to build a society based on trust and respect. Erase prejudices within our own lives that oppress others. Give us a new vision of a life of harmony. Continue to embolden and empower us to speak out against the injustices we see and move us into action to do something about it. The Apostle Paul reminds us that the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sides too deep for words. Holy Spirit, in our weakness, we lift up to you all of our health care workers, first responders, and others who are putting themselves at risk for the sake of others. We pray for those who are sick and in need of your healing touch. We ask that you would provide your comfort and peace to those who have lost loved ones in the recent months due to COVID-19 or for other reasons and have not been able to adequately grieve those deaths. We also especially are mindful of those in our community who find themselves without enough food or diapers or household items. We thank you for ministry partners like the Ralph Reader Food Shelf and Midway Community Mutual Aid who are actively working in our community to combat food insecurity Continue to bless those ministries as they act as your hands and feet in this world. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. On the night in which our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. As often as you eat of it, do so remembering me. In the same manner, also after they had eaten supper, Jesus took the cup. And he blessed it, saying, This cup is a new covenant shed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins for all people. As often as you drink of it, do so remembering me. The bread which we break and the cup which we bless are the communion of the body and blood of Jesus Christ, who teaches us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. Amen.
Thanks for worshiping with us on this Father's Day. Uh, we're glad that you were able to join us for worship. Uh, just a couple of reminders for announcements. As you saw already in this worship video, uh, we continue to do our annual Tons of Love food campaign for the Ralph Reader Food Shelf. This year, because of COVID-19, uh, we're actually asking for monetary donations. And the Ralph Reader Food Shelf actually can buy more food with your monetary donations than what we could uh, do as individuals. And so please give to Ralph Reader. There's some information on this uh, email for you to be able to do that. Uh, or you can always go online to our church website and you can easily find uh, ways to give for our Tons of Love uh, food campaign. That's going to go on through the month of July. We're also going to continue to gather in uh, food and other household items uh, for the Midway Community Mutual Aid. Uh, that'll be happening on Thursdays, every Thursday through the month of July. And so please, if you're able uh, to come by church between 9 and noon to drop off items. We'd appreciate it. There's a couple of other ways that you can volunteer to support that ministry, and you can find that information uh, at our website. also want to let you know about uh, a, a way to catch up with Pastor Kai. Um, so this marks the one-year anniversary of, of Pastor Kai being with us, and so if uh, you want to um, connect with him and hear about uh, what he sees the future of incarnation being and where we're headed. Uh, I encourage you to sign up for those Zoom chats. They're happening on Wednesdays from July uh, through mid-August. And so you can find more information uh, at our website or also in this email. And finally, if you're interested in joining a small group, there's some new small groups that have just started. Uh, you can find more information about that on our website. Uh, now go with this sending. God's renewing spirit is breathing new life into you and all creation. Be alive in the spirit and persistent in love. Thanks be to God. Thanks for worshiping with us. It's good to connect with you. Uh, we hope that you're doing well. We pray for you often and continue to ask God's blessing upon you. Take care.